All set? All set. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for spending part of your day here. Uh, I, I was trained to start off by thanking the sponsors of uh, the series. This is both IRIS and the Seismological Society of America. So what I'm doing today is I'm gonna show the same talk that I gave in the Distinguished Lectures last year. And so I started off with these slides to thank the organizations. So again, thank you. So the debate, the title is Volcanoes, Using Seismology to Find Where the Magma Is and How It Gets to the Surface. So we're going to look at a couple of different ways that seismology is useful. So a basic outline. Uh, first question is, you know, where is the magma? Uh, a fundamental question in volcanology is where is the molten rock? Uh, as you've been following the news lately, you've seen a lot of molten rock arriving to the surface in a very photogenic way. It's been leading half the news broadcast for the last couple of weeks. But fundamentally, a basic geophysical question is, where is the magma? And we look at clues from both seismology and geology. <clears throat> and then a second thing that's a lot of us have spent a significant amount of time in our careers is what happens before eruptions? Given that we know where the magma is, we then want to know how does it move? How does it get to the surface? What are the different processes that go on? So we'll look at a couple of case histories and then some patterns and processes and a little bit about uh, simple modeling. Okay, so we start off with Uh, start off with the schematic from a 1966 textbook. Uh, this is a black and white figure. It shows a magma chamber, kind of a, a round ball at the bottom, and then a tube going up to the surface. And it has a question mark with a little a possible pathway over to the flank. So this is a classic thing called a balloon and straw. For years, volcanologists have had this idea in their head that there's some kind of a pot down there, a magma chamber, and then a conduit or tube connecting it to the surface. Up, What we see at the surface is the main vent in this diagram here is partially blown away. Some volcanoes have a central vent and a, basically a central mountain. Others have small cones on the side, subsidiary cones. So even though the magma most of the time goes from the chamber up toward the surface in this simplified view, sometimes occasionally goes off to the side. So these balloon, so-called balloon and straw models, so the balloon is the magma chamber down at the bottom here and the straw would be the conduit. These models are pervasive. This is from a, a textbook or website just a couple of years ago. The problem is they're, they're way too simple. So we might ask, well, what do we think the actual distribution of magma looks like down there at depth? So here's a couple of realizations that are inspired by geologists. The one on the left shows sort of a, a shallow magma chamber model. So there's still some kind of a chamber, but it's got some sills and dikes coming off of it. Many of these stall out because there's not enough pressure or the rocks are cold, but one of them may eventually punch through to the surface. So in the vicinity of volcanoes, you see high heat. When the magma gets to shallow levels, gases escape, and there's interaction with the groundwater. So this is a little bit more realistic. It's still got some of the same elements, but it allows for a couple of other false choices. One thing we don't know a lot about is the influx of magma at depth shown by the red arrow there. So that's one sort of conceptual view. Here's the second one called a transcrustal magmatic system. So this is mush. Molten rock is not necessarily completely fluid. A lot of times it has crystals in it, and the crystals can be up in the neighborhood of 50%. Well, when you get much more than 50%, they typically call it a mush. Now that there's so many crystals that they're in contact with each other, and it behaves something like a solid sometimes and something like a fluid other times. So it's, and then the idea of this whole magmatic system is that there are many places where there's sills forming, because magma will rise to its level of neutral buoyancy and then spread out sideways. Some of them will share with adjacent ones, some of them will stop, others will eventually rise up and, and occasionally reach up to the surface. So where does this come from? Why do they have these funny ideas? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the rocks that come out of volcanoes are a lot of the inspira inspiration for these models because the rocks in their history, the crystals and the compositional uh, elements of the rock, they preserve their history. They, uh, petrologists using lab experiments can figure out how long a rock sat at a particular temperature and pressure regime to form the minerals <coughs> and then eventually come out of the surface. So geology works together uh, with other scientists to figure out how, uh, where the magma is and how it, how it moves and time scales. So here's, this is sort of a, a schematic of of sort of a contemporary view of how the magma system looks. We'll start over here at the bottom on the right there. Uh, 
the mantle, presumably there's a big density contrast between the crust and the mantle below. Uh, lower velocities and lower densities, higher densities and higher velocities down the mantle. But the, the idea is that the temperature and pressure conditions are such that magma forms at the base of the mantle and it begins to rise up in a series of dikes. Some of these stall out and exchange their heat. So the lower crust tends to be hot in various places. If you get enough of these layers forming together, you get some melt again, a series of conduits going up to the surface. We don't know very well the, the shape and size of magma chambers. So we often draw them in these kind of, you know, a little bit more elaborate than the blue in the straw, but there's some sort of a chamber here. It's got uh, arms sticking out that would be sills and the vertical ones are dikes eventually going up to the surface. So this is sort of more contemporary view. It's a little more complicated than the balloon and straw model, although it has some of the same elements. And it has some places where this is what we would call an intrusion. The magma rose up, same processes spread out, but never reached the surface. So that would be an intrusion. The one that reaches the surface would be an eruption. So then what does seismology contribute? Okay, so seismology, what we do is we put seismic stations on the surface of the ground. They're here shown as schematically as the green triangle. So this is a schematic cross section. This is the ground surface in the vicinity. Here's the volcano, highly exaggerated stations on both sides. The earthquake is this irregular star. When the earthquake happens, waves propagate out like throwing a stone in a pond. So these black lines are the ray path, are the, are the wave fronts. The blue lines show the ray path. So the, the energy from the earthquake travels along a particular path and arrives at a station. Now in the background here, you see a bunch of squares. So what we do is we divide the earth up into, in two dimensions, a bunch of little squares, or in three dimensions, it'd be a bunch of little cubes of, or sometimes they're rectangular shaped of various sizes. And the idea is we, we have what we call a velocity model where we know or estimate the velocity of the rock. So if we know how fast the waves go, we can take the arrival time at the surface and work backward to figure out how long it took to travel through these various little squares to get back to the source. So we use a number of different stations to get the source of the earthquake. And then what's shown here is a couple of anomalous ones. So for this particular ray that traveled along this path here through some of the pink shaded blocks and got to the station, if it travels through a region that has molten rock in it, we can show in the laboratory that molten rock has a low P wave velocity. We call that VP. So that's why it says there, low VP anomaly. So what that means is it's going along at normal speed through the normal rock and all of a sudden it slows down. That means it gets at this particular seismic station late. Similarly, the one over here at the bottom of the figure there is going along. It's, it's travels a different path, but it's also traveling through the partially molten rock. So it'll get to its station late, not as late as the first one because the first one's traveling through more molten rock. So we, what we start with is we start with as a general velocity model as if there was no magma. And then we look at the pattern of the arrival times of the different waves. And we look for places where the waves speed up or slow down. And using a number of earthquakes distributed in different places, there's only one shown here, we can then come up with a model of how the velocity is distributed as a, as a function of position underneath the volcano. So what we actually model is velocity differences. And then we interpret the velocity differences in terms of whether molten rock may be present to explain what's going on. This general idea is called, it's tomography. It's similar to medical tomography on your head. Uh, the medical profession has a great advantage because they can get on both sides of your head. They can put the x-ray source on one side and the receiver on the other and spin it around and get very good resolution. With volcanoes, a problem we have is that we can only put our stations on the surface or occasionally in boreholes, maybe a few hundred meters deep. And then the natural earthquakes, which are sources, are down underneath somewhere, but they're not always ideally distributed. Sometimes we have good distribution of earthquakes. Sometimes there are maybe a whole, a whole bunch of them concentrated in one spot. So we get good information in one place, but not very good elsewhere. Ideally, the diagram here just shows rays traveling through. Uh, you only see as many as run one ray, the blue lines per little block grid element. Uh, to get good answers, you want to have several rays coming from different places all traveling through the same block. And that rarely happens in practice. So let's let's look at a real example. Here is a study done under Mount St. Helens. So the the volcano is shown as a little uh, triangle shaped mountain at the top. A A prime there means this is a cross section. And what we're looking at is the perturbation. So this is perturbations from the starting model. And the red colors are 20% lower speed. So the waves slowed down. Those are the ones that might have gone through magma. And the green and blue are ones that sped up as much as 20%. So this funny purple shaped thing here, this is a schematic diagram of where the petrologists and 
uh, folks put all the information together thought the magma is. So what do we see? Okay, the little cubes are not so small, like this one here. It's about two kilometers sideways and about three kilometers vertically. The one down here is about three kilometers sideways and four kilometers vertically. So the actual blocks are not all the same size. The earthquakes that made this model possible are around depth distributed around here. Places where there's no earthquakes, we, we cannot say whether the model is sped up or slowed down, so they're just shown as white on the figure. Well, this is a little hard to interpret. The, the black lines here are, are contours of equal velocity, and then the colors show the, the percent change from the initial velocity model. So just in terms of percent change, it's a little hard to interpret. So we sometimes take the information and we convert it back to velocity. That's shown on this next figure here. So here's the velocity model based on some on the same data. So you the distribution of colors uh, is different, but the, the blocks are all in the same place. So what we see is, interestingly, near the middle of the figure, right in here, right when we think of right smack in the middle of the magma chamber, the colors are blue. And down here, where magma should be coming in, it's blue. Blue means high velocity. Up here at shallower depths, we get the sort of tan colors a little bit lower than the surroundings. So there isn't an exact map from the seismic velocities to the, to the structure. What we think is happening at depth here where the velocity is high, molten rock comes in, but then it solidifies. And, and it's, it's thought that some of the solidifying magma in the vicinity of the magma chamber actually forms fairly high velocity dikes and sill structures. But this gives us a, a, a rough idea of how the structure is underneath it. And then using the combination of geologic information and geophysics seismology, we try to come up with sort of a composite view of what's under the volcano. So then one other thing is, the previous one is showing the result just in terms of each of the little blocks color coded by its velocity. You can then take your answer and superimpose it. Here, each of the black dots represents an earthquake. So all these little symbols here are earthquakes. And then there's a couple shaded regions, the mountain at the top schematically, a region of low velocity magma at shallow depths. And then this is this high velocity plug. That's what I was trying to say a moment ago about the magma comes into the magma chamber, but it solidifies. And when it solidifies, it can make high velocity structures and then lower than that low velocity magma. So the, the image that we have is, is not perfect. It's got a lot of wiggle room for interpretation, but this is kind of the, the, how, the, how the seismology tells us the depths and the velocities that we then interpret in terms of where the magma is. So now, okay, so these figures have shown mainly spatial features of volcanoes. So now we'll take a look at how magma moves and how the earthquake activity evolves in time before eruptions. There are several different types of earthquakes that occur at volcanoes. We think these represent different processes. So first we'll take a look at these different kinds of earthquakes. The top one we call a high frequency event. It's got a clear P wave, a clear S wave, high frequencies overall. This is a pretty small one. This is a Mount Redout volcano. A second type of earthquake, oh, and by the way, this, these high frequency events, they're pretty much like earthquakes everywhere. It, they represent shear fracture and the you predominantly get high amplitude S waves and also P waves. And that the time difference here tells us how far away the, the wave is or the earthquake is. So the second kind of earthquake is called a hybrid earthquake. If we look at how it starts, we see high frequencies similar to the P wave group here, but then at the end, it's got a bunch of low frequencies. So the thinking here is this is a small earthquake adjacent to one of these conduits or little uh, magma cavities. So the idea is that the earthquake occurs, but it's right adjacent to a structure filled with magma, and then that structure filled with magma vibrates. That creates what we call a hybrid earthquake, hybrid in the sense of mixing two different processes together. So these are all at the same time scale, by the way. The time scale is down at the bottom there. So the third kind of event is called a low frequency event. This looks pretty different. What we see is the P wave is not very distinct. We say it's emergent. This would be impulsive or sharp. This is emergent. It kind of slowly creeps out of the background. Also, we don't really see a clear S wave, and we see lots of low frequencies instead. The highest amplitude waves are low frequencies. The low frequency part looks kind of like the low frequency part of hybrid. So this is thought to be a process of uh, some kind of pressure perturbation inside of one of these pieces of a manga conduit that moves around. And, uh, and, and it's not an earthquake in the sense of slip of rocks past each other, like in the high frequency case, but rather some kind of a fluid process. Below that is volcanic tremor, and we're only showing a piece of it about 30 seconds long. So you notice right away that the dominant frequencies of the tremor are similar to the dominant frequencies of the low frequency events. So these things are often modeled together. This is thought to be a discrete pressure transient. This is sort of a long-term or sustained series of 
pressure transients. So there's some kind of, typically the tremors observed with magma flow, for example, this eruption of Kilauea on TV, there's fairly strong volcanic tremor the entire time the magma is pouring out on the ground surface. The bottom example there shows an explosion. This is from Pavlov volcano up in Alaska. Out in front here are ground waves. They're the typical low frequency events, similar to the low frequency here uh, for the low frequency event. But out here, there's a sharp spike. So this particular station is about eight kilometers away from the volcano. And when an explosion occurs at the summit, there's a partitioning of energy. Some of the energy travels through the ground as ground waves. These are surface waves in this case. And then the air wave travels much more slowly. And when it arrives in the vicinity of the seismometer, the pressure wave in the air pushes down on the ground and makes a sharp spike. So the cool thing is just from looking at the seismograms, we can tell when explosions are occurring. So these are some of the events. Now we'll take a look at how they occur in sequence prior to eruptions. So this is a model, a conceptual model of an earthquake swarm. So volcanoes typically don't have main shock aftershock sequences like most earthquakes places. They have what we call earthquake swarm, which is a lot of small of events of about this similar magnitude all clustered in time and space. So typically we have a background of volcanoes as is caused by heat and, and uh, fluctuations and stresses. Then the first thing that happens is a high frequency event swarm. So we have a swarm of high frequency events. The rate goes up, reaches some peak. Then we have relative quiescence. Sometime during that relative quiescence, we start getting low frequency events. Eventually these join together and form volcanic tremor, which is a long lasting signal, can be hours or days, eventually leading up to eruption. And not shown in this particular version, we sometimes get deep seismicity afterward. So what we see is a steady progression of high frequency events, low frequency events, tremor, and then eruption. So the different types of seismicity represent different processes. The background is heat and regional stresses. And then when magma gets involved, we have the magma increasing pressure as it's worming its way to the surface, uh, producing stresses in the surrounding rocks. And then the magmatic heat is uh, affecting fluid filled cavities. The fluid can either be magma or water or gases. And then at shallower levels, we get vesiculation and interaction with the groundwater. So now I'll step through a series of schematics to show how this might look. Again, sort of a very loose artist conception of the different pieces here. So each one of these will be a cross section. The volcanoes up at the top, the blue is schematically shown the water table. This four kilometer reference depth for earthquakes, four kilometers happens to be the depth where a magma that has four weight percent water dissolved in it, that's where the bubbles start coming out of solution. And that reference depth is shown at each of the uh, subsequent figures. So the, what typically happens is most high frequency events are deeper and most low frequency events are shallower. Low frequency events will be up here, high frequency ones down here. The red is the sort of tongue of magma. Okay, so the first step of this generic swarm then is magma starts to move or increase pressure. The pressure is transmitted to the surroundings, so we start getting increased seismicity in the surroundings, and that will be our high frequency event swarms. So then the next thing, now we get up to shallower levels. Now the magma is at shallower levels where bubbles begin to form. So what often happens then is that once bubbles form, the magma becomes compressible. If the magma has no bubbles in it, then it's incompressible, much like the hydraulic system of a, of a vehicle. Once you start having some bubbles, if you increase the pressure, the bubbles can collapse a little bit, so you have a way to bleed off the pressure. So then schematically, we show that the earthquakes are continuing, but a lower rate, that's the black dots around the edge. So then at shallower levels still, we often see some interaction with groundwater. That can, the small dots here represent some low frequency events, which are thought to be related to uh, hydrothermal processes, interaction with the groundwater. Now, the volcano is often not sitting there benignly. We often see some steam coming out the top. So the blue arrows are showing pathways for water and the little clouds up at the top show steam. So we're, not only are we having changes in seismicity, we often see steam at the ground surface. Here then, as the magma gets even shallower, we often see shallow, very shallow earthquakes. The red arrows are indicating heat. So we get continued steaming, increased signs of heat. The seismicity is continuing at depth albeit at a relatively lower rate. This would be the relative quiescence part of it. And then finally, the eruption, the eruption itself. So when the eruption is going on, these vertical lines up at the top here are showing the ground shaking. Usually the ground shakes continuously when magma is pouring out of the ground or, or ash is shooting into the sky. This is a, a volcanic tremor associated with eruptions shown schematically by the word boom there in ballistics. So for, I said before that Hawaii right now, when the lava fountain is going on, you're getting strong volcanic tremor. That's happening mainly at very shallow depths of a few hundred meters. Now, one thing that we see when we look at our data is we have relatively few earthquakes in the vicinity, 
So part of the reason for that is the pressure of the magma it used to be pushing against the wall rocks, but now it's pushing the molten rock out the hole. So if that happens, you're not transmitting pressures to the surroundings as much, and you get relatively fewer earthquakes. That's part of it. The second thing is the tremor itself signal itself is fairly strong, and it may mask the earthquakes that are occurring. So if you do some filtering on the data, you can sometimes see the, uh, that the earthquakes are actually there under the tremor. If you just look at the raw records, you don't, you don't see that. You see this tremor signal during eruptions. So then a final step here is readjustment at depth. So we took molten rock that was formerly stored at depth. We passed it through the system out the top. And now we have a space problem at the bottom. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes afterward, you see evidence of deeper earthquakes reflecting changing stresses at depth as the magma system establishes new equilibrium conditions and new magma starts to come in. So in terms of then the, the sequence, so we just done a quick walk through this sequence, background, high frequency, peak rate. So one important thing, it would be life would be easier if the eruptions always occurred right when the peak rate was happening, but this doesn't happen. So you get reach a peak rate and then it drops off. Now normally you'd think, oh, the rate's going away, things are not happening as much. Maybe we're not going to have an eruption. Well, the telltale thing, even though the rate has gone down, the fact that these other types of events that are typically shallower are occurring is is a clue that that we still have to be concerned, even though we have what we call relative quiescence. So each one of these increases the level of concern. And the, the reason this sort of scheme works and why we call it generic is high frequency swarms are typically deeper, low frequency events are shallow and tremor is shallower still. So what we're seeing with this sequence events and changing rates, changing type events, we're seeing evidence of the ascent of the magma toward the surface. And that helps form the basis of our uh, contemporary evaluations of seismicity for, for eruptions. So then look at a couple real world examples Here's one of my favorite ones is off Edo in Japan. This was a small basaltic volcano that formed on the ocean floor back in July of 1989. The swarm began over here on June 30th. So we're looking at three weeks on the horizontal axis, reaches the peak rate. So the bars here show the number of earthquakes per unit time. Uh, I think it's every three hours. And they drop off, the largest earthquake occurs here. The black dots are low frequency events followed by tremor and finally eruption. So on a scale of three weeks with this basaltic volcano, we're seeing this whole series of steps that I described as a, as a generic swarm. So that's one example. Here's a second example. This volcano is, should be familiar to many people. This is Mount St. Helms. Now our time scale is two months across the, the horizontal axis. Instead of being basalt, Mount St. Helms produced dacite. So the swarm started over here, reached its peak, over here near the beginning in, in late March. Uh, some, a few days later, low frequency events started. Then these vertical bars down here show the incidence of volcanic tremor. This one had a, a long time of the relative quiescence. The earthquakes continued and some of the larger ones near the end and finally the eruption occurred. But it's the same relative sequence of events even though the total volume of magma involved was much larger and the chemistry was completely different. It's a, the same series of events. Now here's a third example. The previous two were sort of interpretive diagrams. This one is actually looking at a seismogram. So this is a seismogram for a, about one day. So if you look at the time here, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like about half a day shown. 12 o'clock at the top, 2200 at the bottom, and each line across is 30 minutes. So each two lines is an hour. So what we see then is a, a, just a handful of earthquakes out here about five hours before. The earthquakes increase about an hour before. Each one of these little bursts of energy is an earthquake. Then we get the continuous volcanic tremor, and finally the eruption starts. This is scary. This was a this entire precursory sequence. It has the same steps, but the entire sequence only lasted about five hours. And I got a phone call on a Saturday, a little after 1 p.m., informing me that the ash cloud from the eruption was already up to 16 kilometers. And as we went back and looked at the data. We were sort of astonished by this because this is much shorter than any other precursory sequence. And sure enough, you can see this this pattern of activity, but with a very short time scale of only about five hours. So, okay, I just told you we had this very short one of five hours. So sort of a basic question you might ask, well, how much time do we have? How long do these sequences typically last? So here's a histogram, it's, it's fairly robust. It's based on a sample of 385 swarms. It's got number of cases as a histogram, and this is log of the number of days. So it's a log axis on the horizontal scale. So this bar here is from one to two days, two to four, four to eight, 
8 to 16, etc. So it's a log scale. We see it's basically a normal distribution. So if you have what looks like a normal distribution on a log axis, we call this a log normal distribution. So this distribution has a mean of about five, five and a half days. The shortest ones out here are just a few hours and the longer ones are longer than a year. But in general, and this is this is useful to know, most of the swarms, the action takes place on a scale of about five and a half days, but a little bit less than a week. So to conclude then, so seismology is used to determine where the magma is stored. What I, what I showed earlier was some examples of tomography that we used to, to do a basic study of where is the magma. This was done a lot in the 70s as possible sources of geothermal power. So networks of seismometers were put out, earthquakes were recorded, the data were analyzed to figure out where the low velocity regions were that could be potential magma bodies. Um, I'd say a, half, a third to a half of the volcanoes out there have some kind of tomography study if there's a seismic network in the vicinity. It's not always possible to do it before an eruption, but it, it helps to interpret what's going on afterward. So the models based on seismology are then used to interpret the structure and to establish a basis for the monitoring. So the, the better we know where the magma is and where it's stored and its characteristics overall and volume and things, the better position we are to use the seismology to monitor what's happening as, as the seismicity changes leading up to possible eruptive activity. So then seismology is one of the main tools used for eruption forecasting. Uh, we often, it, it's been published that if you only had a single instrument to use at a volcano, you'd want a seismometer. You get a pretty bang for the pretty big bang for the buck with a seismometer. Uh, then after that, you'd want to add geodesy so you can tell if the volcano's inflating or not, and then a ways to track the heat, cameras, you know, there's a whole bunch of different instruments that we use, but we get a pretty big bang for the buck with seismology, and it's it's very useful because not only can tell us what's happening at the time, but since we can see earthquakes at depth, it can tell us about processes that are going on at depth and changing uh, on a scale of days and weeks. So the time frames are usually days to weeks, occasionally shorter or longer. Um, I haven't seen too much detailed information about the Kilauea eruption. I, I know there was some activity, uh, geophysical activity was preceding the eruptive activity at the surface. And I'm sure over the next uh, several months, we'll be learning a lot more about what preceded that eruption. So that wraps up my presentation. I just have a couple of photos in action. Here is me and one of our former USF students, uh, Armando, down in in uh, one of the volcanoes in Nicaragua. And then on the job at Talica, we were working on some seismographs nearby, went over to take a look inside the crater. It was mostly uh, lots of steam, but occasionally the, the steam would clear away for a moment and you could see the incandescence at the bottom of the crater. Nasty place, lots of uh, SO2 in the air, so we had to uh, wear a gas mask and we only hung around there for about a half hour. So thank you very much. I guess I'll hand it back to Andy and I'll try to answer any questions for you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we already have one question, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And I would encourage everyone out there, if you have uh, questions that you want to bring up now or comments, uh, please type those into the question box, and uh, we'll, we'll file through those uh, before we adjourn today. But uh, the question that I have uh, right at the top is from Chastity Aiken, and she asks, what controls the time to eruption from the start of a sequence, i.e., high frequency events. Okay, so I'm gonna back up to the pictures there. Uh, so if we look at the sequence, you're asking to switch from background to the onset of the high frequency events. So basically, we think that the molten rock starts to move. What's driving it ultimately is density difference. The molten rock, because it's hot, when you, most of the time you heat up things, they, they expand, so their density is lower. So new magma is being fed from below. Eventually, the magma sitting there becomes gravitationally unstable and it starts to move. So it either moves or pressure increases and it transmits stresses to the surroundings. And the surroundings are shown here where all the dots are. So notice that the earthquakes are not necessarily right where the magma is. So that means the rocks here have faults in them and they're sort of sitting there ready to go. And if you have a pressure fluctuation caused by the magma, uh, typically a pressure increase, then it will start triggering earthquakes. So that, that's, the, that's what causes it. As far as the, the exact timing, one thing we don't know very well, we don't know the background condition in a lot of places. We don't know the density of faults. We don't know how ready they are to, to slip. If you have a place that's very benign and quiet, uh, 
it might take a lot of pressure to trigger some earthquake activity. If it's sitting there like a hair trigger and all those faults are very near failure, then a, a very minor fluctuation can cause the onset of earthquakes. So it turns out that not every swarm leads to eruption. In fact, I've asked colleagues over the years, and the numbers I've heard range from about one out of three to one out of 10 swarms eventually leads to an eruption. And part of the motivation for this generic sequence was to figure out, you know, how excited you get every time an earthquake swarm starts. And if it's only one out of 10, then you want to be a little calmer in your approach. You don't have to worry that every single one's going to turn into an eruption. All right, thanks. Um, so there were two questions that came right on top of each other, both on the same thing from Felix Rodrigo Rodriguez and Ben Vanderplume. And they were both asking about what about focal mechanisms associated with these earthquakes? Um, you know, how, how similar or different are they than sort of regular seismicity? Yeah, those, those are good questions. So one branch of seismology, you know, you usually start out getting the location of the quake. You look at the earthquake location and you look at the type of event and, and that's what your starting point. But then when you have enough stations, you can get fulcrumisms for the events. So if these ideas are right, that increasing pressure in the magma, then that says the pressure is pushing away, then we should see the, the pressure axis on the earthquakes back and forth sort of to and from where the magma is. I'm sliding the arrow back and forth so you can see it. As opposed to late in the sequence, we should see contractional uh, strains. If this, if the magma body was previously larger and now shrunk, then we should show a couple of arrows here to show where how the, the, the rocks are moving and we would see a reversal. So increasing pressure with the arrows would be the opposite way after the eruption, the arrows would be in. There's a handful of published cases that, published cases that show this effect. Um, often the eruptions themselves are difficult to interpret because you have the uh, volcanic tremor that's masking the signal. So some studies are done effectively a year or two after an eruption and you start to see the replenishment process and the focal mechanism is very helpful for that. All right, uh, next question is from uh, Valbone Mametti and uh, Valbone asks, I have heard that the collapse of chamber margins can cause earthquakes, any comment? Ah, okay. Yeah, so the geologic evidence is, um, and one of the places this happened was at Vesuvius, its famous 79 AD eruption. If you go out and look at the deposits, what you see first is a whole bunch of just regular old magma. And then as the eruption enters its later stages, you start seeing uh, xenoliths, pieces of rock, the country rock, from depth that are incorporated with the magma. So the idea is, as the pressure, if you start venting a whole bunch of magma from the magma reservoir out to the surface, at some point, the pressure becomes lower inside the magma chamber. And at that point, if the pressure is not high enough to hold up the roof, then you get collapse of the roof rocks. And so some seismicity uh, in association with the end stages of eruptions is thought to represent this process. I, I, I'd have to say, I don't think I've seen, I've never seen like somebody show a single particular earthquake and say, you know, definitively, this earthquake is signs of roof collapse, but rather the two processes are happening at the same time. And it's reasonable because the, the roof collapse is evidence that there's fractures going on. All right. Um, uh, similar, well, uh, another question sort of in this uh, range is from Elena Russo. And Elena asks, have you ever tried to relate seismicity and magmatic intrusion, intrusions? What happens? What kind of surficial deformation occurs on top of an inflating sill in an extensional area, for example? All right, I'll refer to this picture again. Okay, so if I use this picture, if, if magma is intruding, then what you typically see at the surface, you'd get uplift in advance of where the magma is. And typically the, the ground surface would be tilting away or so down away from the volcano or uh, at some distance you'd have deflation. So you, the deformation pattern at the surface is can be linked to the shape of the magma intruding from depth. Um, so that's more geodesy than seismology. Seismology, so the things, things you might do with seismology, if all the earthquakes are in one spot, a real tight little cluster, then you might imagine a what we call a point source. So there might be a single place where there's a stress concentration. And then on the surface, you would expect to see a fairly uh, symmetrical round deformation pattern. 
if instead the earthquakes were showing uh, a lateral extent so that when you looked at it in map view, you saw what looks like a line of earthquakes, then you'd have a basis for saying there's either a fault or a dike there. And then you would check with the corresponding deformation and see if the evidence was more in favor of a, of a linear feature. So, I mean, at a pretty basic level, that's what we do. We look for if it's round or point-like or if it's lateral. And if it's lateral, what's its size, shape, and orientation? That's that's kind of what we get from seismology. That would be combined. Focal mechanisms should agree with uh, geodesy in terms of figuring out the orientation of the of the dikes and sills in the vicinity of a volcano. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, we have another question from Leonardo Vanderlot, and uh, his question is more about uh, the seismology side of things. So, how many stations would be the minimum? for performing seismic tomography in a volcano. Uh, also, uh, he's curious about what sort of distribution is ideal. Yeah, okay, well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm gonna answer it in a couple of ways. First, uh, there's, there's four unknowns to locate an earthquake. There's the latitude, the longitude, the depth, and the origin time. So the absolute minimum number of stations would be four just to locate an earthquake. If you did that, you would not be able to do much tomography because there wouldn't be enough uh, variation in the signal. So typically, you'd want to have at least six. Uh, our whole time in Alaska, we tried to put networks of about eight stations out. With eight stations, assuming they all stay working, not only do you get more P waves and more S waves to get the earthquake locations, but now you'd be able to, you, you can pick up small differences in the travel time. You notice, for example, that the earthquakes tend to arrive a little bit early on a particular station, a little bit late. Now, this is enough to begin doing the basic elements of tomography. From a practical element, you can do it with as few as eight stations. Most people don't like to touch tomography work unless they have 12 or 20 or more stations. This is a classic case where more is better. Because of that problem that I mentioned in one of the slides earlier of, of uh, which, how many blocks are you able to resolve, the more stations you have, and if, particularly if your earthquakes are well distributed, then you can do a much better job of resolution. That is, you want your blocks to be as small as possible. Because if you don't have a ray passing through a block, you have no information about it. So if the earthquakes are very widespread, you can get fewer seismic stations. That might be true of a place like Long Valley, although uh, Long Valley in California has pretty good access, so there tend to be a lot of stations too. But the earthquakes are pretty well distributed, so you can get away with fewer stations. Some of our loosened volcanoes, you're lucky to get six or eight stations in, and you're never going to get a very good tomography answer. Um, typically, if you can't afford it, or if you can at least short term put in between 12 and 20 stations, that seems to be a pretty good trade off between getting uh, a good spatial array and then uh, a sufficiently high number of ray paths traveling through different blocks to be able to solve the problem in a practical way. All right, uh, next question is from Reno Proti, and Reno asks, are there differences in the model for new eruptions after decades of quiescence like Turrialba and for open system volcanoes which have been erupting for decades like Arenal? Yeah, so this, this, uh, this generic model that I showed, this works pretty well for first eruptions at volcanoes that have, been, have not erupted for a long time. Um, once you have an open plumbing system, then, for example, if you have a vent that was previously choked off, you can build up pressure. But once it becomes open vent, you can't build up pressure. So what that means is, what would you expect to see for a second later eruption? You would expect to see fewer high frequency event swarms because you're not able to build the pressures. So anytime you build up pressure in the magma, it's able to vent to the surface. So then we switch to a situation where all you might see would be low frequency events and tremor. So yes, the conditions are different for the so-called open vent or long-lasting eruptions. I mean, Arenal uh, has been erupting since about 1968. It's produced continuous tremor virtually the entire time. So that's the, the fundamental problem down there is that, you know, ideally you'd have a nice quiet site so that you could locate the earthquakes. You put a station anywhere in the vicinity of Arenal and you've got tremor going all the time. And so it's it's tough to uh, meet those the conditions of a quiet place. Once, once the activity is, is already underway, the rules are a little different and they require a sort of a more comprehensive evaluation of the of the expectation based on the on the, the changing conditions at the volcano. All right, uh, next question is from Amy Wright and Amy uh, asks, uh, every now and then I locate 
DLPs at our Cascade Volcanoes. Can you describe what is happening with low-frequency earthquakes that are deep, for instance, greater than five kilometers? Ah, well, that's interesting. Um, I had a, a different version of this talk for a more technical audience where I addressed that. The deep, long-period events are kind of problematic. They don't fit. Does this generic sequence here mostly covers shallow events uh, for which we have abundant data. Uh, as networks have gotten better and better, particularly recently, there's there's more evidence of the, the deeper long period events. So it turns out in some places, the three examples I show are, if you look at Kilauea, deep long period events and tremor, they hand, tend to be pretty much at the steady rate. They're down to depths of like 40 kilometers or so. And uh, we think that is evidence of long-term steady supply of magma at depth. Now, the rate of eruption at the surface can be pretty different. Um, with Mount Pinatubo, there were deep, long period events uh, a couple of weeks before the big eruption. And these were thought to be injection of basaltic magma, which then mixed with the day site and caused it to become unstable, eventually resulting in eruption. So it's a possible class of precursors. More recent eruptions, Mount Redoubt in 2009 had some deep, long period events happening prior. Then there's Mount Spur in 1992. There were very few deep long period events. Then a series of eruptions occurred in 1992, and then there were hundreds of deep long period events afterward. So the, these deep long period events are part of the story. And I think the question was partly asking about very long period events or VLP. Um, I think they're they're either larger structures or slower time scale. In other words, the same you have a pressure pressure fluctuation in some sort of a conduit or crack, but depending on the time scale and the, the exact stress conditions in the vicinity, you have a pressure pulse and it, it, it moves, uh, the, the, the wall rocks move apart and then maybe come back together again, but it happens on a time scale, it can, be, it can be 10 or 20 seconds. So you can get these fairly long period signals, even though the physical dimension of the source may be small. That's, that's one way that some volcanic sources are pretty different than earthquake sources. For, for earthquakes, since, since Fracture tends to be, the actual rupture process tends to be at a fairly constant speed, two or three kilometers per second. To get long periods requires a long fault. But volcanoes, where this was shown as Oslo volcano, there's a, a feature at Oslo volcano, a hydrothermal feature that's, you know, only a few hundred meters across, but it was producing waves that had periods of 10 to 20 seconds or longer. So basically, you know, you pump, the pressure would increase, the thing would expand, then the pressure would bleed off and it would, it would uh, deflate. And so you got these long period signals associated with the with the hydrothermal system. I imagine some processes like that associated with with uh, magma at depth, uh, exact position and exact roles of the bubbles depend on the depth. So that's a little bit of a complicated question. All right, uh, we have another kind of uh, paired set of questions. I'll try to uh, hybridize these. These are from Steve Malone and uh, Tammy Mulder, and they're both concerned uh, what are the pre-eruption sequences or what are indicators for volcanoes that have been quiescent for long time scales? So months to years to even centuries, what do those look like if they start to reactivate? That's another good question. Um, I, I don't have an exact answer for that one. I, the, the expectation is uh, if it's been a long time since the previous eruption, uh, decades to hundreds of years, say, then we think that the crust becomes colder, mechanically stronger, uh, open pore spaces and fractures are, are sealed by uh, uh, percolating fluids and, you know, mineralization and such things. So if it's, if it's colder and stronger, then as you increase the pressure of magma from below, then you have to do more work on the surroundings. So we, ex we expect a more extensive precursory sequence. So that's the critical assumption there is that the cold is crust, the, the crust is cold and strong as a result of it being a long time. So how would that show up in our seismic data? Well, one of the things we'd look for is a systematic change in the what's called the B value. The, it's a ratio of small earthquakes to large earthquakes. We know from lab studies and some uh, larger scale natural studies that if you change the stress, if you increase the stress, the B value typically goes down. If you increase the thermal gradient or increase the pore pressure, the B value goes up. So some seismic sequences have been evaluated with this idea in mind, and we look for a systematic change, not just in the rate of earthquakes, 
which would be like the onset of a high frequency swarm, but also in this ratio of small to large events, which tells us something about the surrounding conditions. So this, this sort of work is in progress. There isn't, I don't think there's just a single neat answer other than the expectation would be that for a place that's been a really long time, what you'd look for, if you want, if you want to get your direct evidence that there's uh, either heat or poor pressure increase would be a change in the B value, increasing the B value with time. So you need to have enough events in the background to be able to get this sample, uh, typically a few hundred events, and then enough events in the new sequence. If the if the rates are really low, and if some of these processes are aseismic, then you don't get a very good answer. I guess the, the second half of Steve's question, which I kind of glossed over, was is there any way to tell one volcano from another I, seismically, if behaviorally, if they haven't, if either hasn't had large eruptions for a long time in terms of their seismic signature? Well, back especially in my student days, the, the, the thinking used to be that well, every volcano is sort of unique, like, like people have different personalities. Uh, that each volcano was unique in its seismic behavior. So you might go learn a set of rules at Hawaii or Kilauea that worked pretty good there, but then you'd have trouble turning them around and applying them elsewhere. I think this is sort of one of these ongoing questions that we try to find what are the controlling parameters and then that these that may guide us into figuring out which volcanoes to group together. I've seen seismograms and I've seen the seismic time histories of volcanoes that they're almost interchangeable between several volcanoes so that there is possible to have groups of volcanoes that behave similarly. Um, basaltic volcanoes, for example, the, the swarms are typically shorter in duration. Uh, the, the more uh, silicic volcanoes tend to have longer swarms. Uh, we, I, I can't say with 100% certainty. I'd like to think that the basaltic magma is more fluid and moves more easily and the dacitic magma, for example, is stiffer and more viscous and moves more slowly. So Going back to this generic swarm idea, you might have the same sequence of events, but you would expect that the higher silica content would rise more slowly, hence longer lasting swarms and more time between processes. So we're still, we still dance around these issues. Um, I think what we actually do in practice is a volcano erupts, we go get the data, we analyze it, we figured out what happened. What's much harder to do is to get a standard suite of the same data for a whole group of volcanoes of different compositions and different ages and different times since the last eruption to be able to answer those questions systematically. We sort of take the data that we have and try to backfill as best we can, but we, we can't answer all these questions with equal insight. All right, uh, next question is from Chastity Aiken again. And uh, Chastity asks, do volcanoes that erupt frequently have similar sequences or do they decrease as in the Akmak case? Um, okay, I'll use a, an example of Redoubt Volcano back in 1989 and 90. It started erupting in December and had, I think, 26 phases of eruption uh, ending in April of 1990. So some scientists went and looked at the precursory sequences and there was a clear pattern for a number of events is that there would be an increase in long period events and then an eruption would occur and then there would be some evidence of relaxation and this the, the eruptions were happening like every five to seven days or so so they just got to the point where they were going to make a, a series of predictions and then uh the rate changed so this is you know everybody laughed at the time this is this is nature being perverse um, the relative sequence of events stayed the same, but something that we don't always know, we try to infer, is the, what's the rate of the magma inflowing? Some of these events, uh, particularly low frequency events and tremor, are, we think, are related to properties of the magma moving. And so the rate at which the magma moves is going to be one of the underlying controlling parameters. We usually work retrospectively or backwards. We look at the rate of earthquakes and we try to pronounce whether the magma is speeding up or slowing down much harder to do in real time because you know all we have is the seismicity which is incomplete and for example one one problem with this relative quiescence and why it's sort of a bugaboo is uh when you have the relative quiescence it could be quiescence meaning that pressure is building up or equalized or you know some other transient condition has occurred but it could also be the beginning of an end of eruption because eventually the eruptions will quiet down and, and the volcano the seismic events will stop and the volcano will go back to sleep so how do you distinguish the relative quiescence from 
from the end of an eruption. You only know that if you wait a few days or, or weeks or whatever the time is. So the, the, what you can actually accomplish in real time at a volcano observatory is a bit different than what you can conjecture theoretically when you have all the data in hand and have, have a chance to look at it, at it retrospectively. All right, uh, next question is from Shimon Wedowinski, and Shimon asks, what is the elevation reference for the four kilometer depth of bubble formation? Is it sea level, max elevation of the volcano, or average elevation? Uh, I would use the, the depth from the bottom of the crater. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically a pressure converted from a depth. So the idea is uh, in the laboratory, you can show uh, kilobar stresses and will close up pore spaces. So rocks are sort of porous and they transmit fluids, but when you squeeze them at about kilobar stresses, which corresponds to about three kilometers, uh, three kilometers overburden, then you start closing the spore spaces and the, and the fluids don't move. So the reference frame would basically be the bottom of the crater. Great, thanks. Um, next question is from Jiming Niu, and uh, Jiming asks, may I ask, uh, may I ask what may control the time of magma transport from chamber to water table? Uh, that would be the, the, the amount of heat and the, the, how fluid the magma is. So when magma moves, uh, first it's got to open a pathway, it's got to push the rocks aside and Move, start moving. Well, as the hot magma is in contact with the cold rocks, it loses some heat. So the, the magma right near the edge gets relatively cooled and becomes stiffer. And the part out in the middle stays relatively fluid. And as long as you keep adding enough heat in from below, it can stay molten and stay moving. So there's, there's a trade-off in the processes there. So you'd, on an individual case, you'd have to figure out the, the size of the conduit, and I should say the size of the conduit is one of the things we just flat out don't know. We just, we make wild guesses and and try to figure as best we can how how big they are. But if you know that, then you know what the flow rate would need to be. And you can, from there, you can go to the thermodynamics and figure out if the magma would, would stay molten long enough to reach it to the surface or, or the water table. All right, uh, next question is from Britt O'Neill at the Pascal Instrument Center. And Britt asks, can you tell us a bit more about determining the depth of magma sources? Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one. I mean, seismology, we're good at doing earthquake sources. So referring to the tomography example, uh, either one of these. So what we, you know, what we get a depth to is a velocity change. And then we have to do a couple, jump through a couple of hoops. We have to figure out if it's geologically reasonable to associate a velocity change with a specific uh, geologic feature. So, I mean, one thing I see is virtually everybody who works at a volcano uh, I'm will we'll use red colors for molten and blue colors for uh, sorry red colors for low velocity and blue colors for high velocity now it's not an accident that low velocity it also correspond to magma so a lot of times uh, studies will show red colors and it's it's a leap to say ah where the red is must be where the magma is but that's not strictly speaking what's going on what we're actually seeing is low velocity regions and um an area of research that uh is revisited from time to time is trying to work out exactly what the relationship is between the change in speed of a seismic wave and the changing physical conditions in other words what percentage of molten rock do you have to have and is it enough to, suppose you had a little isolated little isolated pellets of magma that were not connected to each other, how, that would behave different mechanically, even though the percent of partial melt might be the same, that would behave pretty differently than if you had say penny shaped cracks or thin wafers of magma that were spread out. So now we got an additional problem. All we have is a seismic velocity. We don't know that much about the geometry of the molten rock and the, then you add in the percent gas. So our answers are increasingly elusive. We, we sort of get a bulk answer and what we want to know are details and we, we can rarely do that with, with great precision. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have another question from the group at the, the, at the PIC. Uh, this one's from Kevin Nicholas and he asks, is it possible to locate fissure openings using these techniques? Um, I mentioned before that if we saw a line of seismicity, uh, 
we would be tempted to say that that's a, a fault or a dike. And if that's happening at very shallow depths near the surface, then we'd have a basis for saying it was a fissure. The, the best example I know of, of this was in, the, I believe it was Krafla volcano in Iceland back in the in the late 70s, early 80s. But there was a, the seismicity was moving. It was moving in a linear fashion. And there was a lot of debate about whether there was a dike extending. Some people said yes, some people said no, maybe it's just a previous fault that's showing activity. Well, then the dike intersected a geothermal hole. And the geothermal hole, this is amazing, pieces of pumice actually came out of the geothermal hole. So that pretty much clinched the argument in that case that this migrating seismicity in a linear fashion along a shallow feature was in fact dike propagation. And it, when it reached the vicinity of the, of the geothermal hole, it, the pumice came out and demonstrating that this was actually happening. Is that true in every case? No, I mean, that's, that's one of those like wonderful stories that we tell our students. Um, but in general, you know, it's just, it's geometry. If you have enough stations, uh, to get good good locations, because uh, some of these earthquakes would be very small, then it's a, it's a geometric problem. You're you're looking for linear features near the surface that would be uh, would would be consistent with the formation of fissures. All right. Uh, next question is from Sahand uh, Hajimirza, and uh, Sahand asks: Can seismic waves determine the depth of bubble nucleation at, and magma fragmentation in silicic systems? Ah, that's, this is another one of these nasty questions, uh, depending on the energetic and time scale. Um, theoretically, it ought to be possible if these things are happening on scales of several hundred meters. I, I have yet to see one convincing in practice. Um, the trouble is these processes are quite vigorous processes. You start getting superposition of seismic waves. So you got, imagine a conduit, and suppose it's a few hundred meters long. You got fragmentation in the upper portion and nucleation at depth. Well, the fragmentation is a pretty energetic process. It's putting energy uh, out of the hole and also pushing on the walls, creating things like volcanic tremor. But some of the waves are traveling down the conduit and in the surroundings. So any deeper processes like nucleation, which is one that we all want to know about, um, you occasionally see some changes in, in properties. Like there's, there's occasionally evidence of, of the velocity inside the conduit changing. We see that as a there's something called gliding uh, of volcanic tremor where the frequencies change systematically. And there's there's a couple possible ex explanations of that. One is the length changing, and the other is the bubble concentration changing. And then you can link that to a change in velocity or, or a change in depth. So we might be able to say that the, the nucleation front is moving up or down and by how much, but we, we have a tough time giving an exact location uh, where it's happening at, at the same time as it's happening. We, this is an, an important issue, but it's remained elusive for a long time. All right, uh, next question is from Mario Ruiz, and Mario asks, what are the differences between VLP and LP or LF? What do these differences mean? Uh, okay, so the LF versus LP part, uh, the, the dominant frequencies are typically in the range two to three hertz. This is for most uh, mostly short period stations in the vicinity of volcanoes and, and distances on the order of, of a few kilometers. Um, low frequency, in, the way I use it is more of a, uh, a looser term or a more general term based simply on the appearance of the seismogram. Long period was a term introduced and it had a genetic connotation and it implied that you knew what the source process was. And so I've personally been a little wary of simply calling everything LP when it has low frequencies because you can have different processes occurring to the production of low frequency. So I use uh, low frequency more generally, long period if there's specific evidence of, of a particular source mechanism. And then VLP, once broadband seismometers came into being, uh, the community discovered that there were a lot of signals that were much lower frequencies than the two to three hertz that were common for the what we previously called low frequency events. And historically, they started calling them very low frequency, uh, sorry, very long period events. Um, and the, the frequency, the, I'll switch to period. The periods are typically five to 10 seconds, occasionally 20 seconds or longer. And uh, these don't seem to be exactly the same process as the what are typically called low frequency or LP events. Um, they are, taking place on a much more extended time scale may involve larger structures and I think represent uh, you know a different suite of processes than the than the smaller uh, 
uh, low frequency or long period events. All right. Um, related questions from Rebecca Coates, and she was curious if you can get low frequency earthquakes as swarms as as well, um, in addition to just high frequency. Yes, very much. Um, in fact, low frequency events often occur in swarms. Um, I mentioned readout earlier uh, in its 1989 90 eruption, it started off with a, a vigorous swarm of long period events that I think there were several thousand events in one day for prior to the first eruptions. And then later on, uh, smaller swarms, maybe several tens of events. And that's common in a lot of volcanoes. The one I did my thesis on was called Pavlov Volcano. It, had, it frequently had swarms of, uh, of low frequency events. So that's pretty common. I think um, Japanese scientists years ago used to use the low frequency events. They, they called them B-type events back then. Uh, but they noticed that the higher numbers of per day of the B-type events correlated with times of increased eruptive activity, particularly basaltic volcanoes. And so they could almost use the the swarminess, if you will, the the the, the rates of the low frequency events as a as a proxy for the activity of the volcano. That, that idea has been kicking around for a long time. So what does that tell us? That tells us these events generally occur at shallow depths. Uh, they're associated with fluid pressurization processes like magma movement and bubble, bubble exclusion and such things. And they're associated with active volcanoes and very common at, at relatively open vent volcanoes. So that, that all sort of hangs together pretty well that the, uh, that the rate or the, the, uh, the increased likelihood of swarms would correspond to the higher rate of activity for, for this type of volcanoes. Uh, there's a related question here from Lud Ludmila Adam, um, and she asks, is there a model for what is the main control on the LP events and their frequency content? Are they controlled mostly by fracture conduit width or length or fluid type, uh, such as magma, water, or gas? Um, let's see. I think the best answer for that, my... Uh, a colleague at USGS named Bernard Chouet some years ago developed a series of models and asked exactly those questions. He did a series of numerical models looking at uh, cracks with different length to width and thickness ratios and then filled them up with fluids with different bubble concentrations. So you could see systematically how the events would look if you kept the crack dimensions the same and changed the bubble concentration or kept the bubble dimensions the same bubble concentration the same and then change the physical dimensions of the of the size or thickness. So there's a series of those. Those are published. Uh, Chouet is C-H-O-U-E-T, and there have been some follow-up studies, I believe. Those are those are the main ones that address that specific part of it. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, we're starting to enter the home stretch of questions. I think there's only uh, seven or eight left. <laughs> there's been a very, uh, very good set of uh, questions and comments from the audience so far. Um, there's uh, one from uh, Leonardo Vanderlot. Uh, he has a question uh, following up. I think uh, he is studying POAS volcano seismicity associated with the 2017 eruption uh, in April, and he uh, notes that it had uh, most of the high frequency seismicity occurred after the first eruption. And he asked, is this possibly related to readjustment? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good bet. Um, let's see, POAS, I went to POAS years ago. Um, I don't know exactly where these high frequency events were. I'm guessing they're probably say three to seven kilometers depth and probably a bit off to the side. So if there is, if there's some eruption, then that the, the, the eruption itself can change the stress conditions at depth. And you know, the, the, the magma's sitting there happy, pushing against the surroundings, some perturbation occurs, the magma erupts. Now you've changed the stress conditions at depth. And if you do that in the sense that you favor shear slip on a fault or uh, reduce the normal stresses, then you can increase the seismicity. So uh, I would I guess I would check the focal mechanism. I check the depth carefully and the depths and the focal mechanism carefully to see if there's a consistent uh, pattern in terms of how the, the stresses might change to, to accommodate such a, a condition.
All right. Uh, we have a question from David Miller asking uh, or commenting, it seems like we often see shallow crustal reservoirs in the three to six kilometer range imaged by both tomography and geodesy. Besides lower crustal mass zones, which are thought to be a magma source, do you see any evidence for distinct mid-crustal reservoirs at any of the volcanoes you study, specifically with seismological evidence? Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, so B value anomalies have shown, there's about 15 or 20 of those. They typically show uh, anomaly at about seven to 10 kilometers or so in the vicinity of a magma chamber. About a third of them show shallower anomaly about three kilometers down, uh, about the depth where low frequency events begin. Um, a volcano we've been working on in Bolivia uh, looks like the top of a magma chamber is about, I think 10 to 12 kilometers, I uh, I wish I did. I can't remember if it's respect to sea level or, or the surface of the ground. Like the, it's a 6,000 meter peak, so it's not trivial uh, if it's the top of the peak as a reference versus the, the sea level effect. But there, there's a very strong reflector. Um, the rock above it is high velocity and the rock below it, where you're in the magma chamber now, is low velocity. So you get a strong reflection and a phase reversal at the from waves that are hitting the, the top of that. Um, other places show uh, evidence of depth more from geodesy. Uh, the pattern of deformation is consistent with, with deeper structures. Seismology, strictly speaking, there are a variety of different uh, depths encountered, but they sort of have to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, uh, next uh, sort of a related question would be from Valbone Mamedi, and uh, Valbone comments that the cache model is correct and you have multiple stacked magma chambers. Can you image each separately or at what scale will the signals be hard to separate? Ah, okay, so in principle, if there's a velocity contrast, then some of the energy would be transmitted and some reflected when a wave comes up and hits a boundary. So in principle, we should be able to figure it out. Like we'd be able to tell the difference between a single magma body, a single layer, if you will, or a series of a half dozen that are a kilometer or so apart. Um, the wavelengths, let's see, for typical waves that might be say five hertz for the case of uh, high frequency earthquakes, uh, typical cross of velocities are about five kilometers per second. So the wavelengths are about a kilometer. So I think you'd have a tough time seeing too much, uh, anything too much smaller than that, like something on the order of a few hundred meters scale, you wouldn't be able to see very well. This is a, the metaphor is an ocean liner. An ocean liner doesn't feel every little wave because the, the, the ocean liner itself has a relatively long wavelength, whereas a canoe would feel every little uh, wave but might miss the big swells. The ocean liner catches the big swell. So you, you you're able to see uh, structures bigger than the length of your seismic waves. That's ultimately what it comes down to. If you can, if you can, if you have sufficiently high frequencies in your sources of so local earthquakes, then you'd get better ability to see the smaller structures. But I'm afraid we're at the sort of kilometer scale right now. Here's a related question from Kyle Brill that ties into what you were just saying. Could some accelerometer-based citizen science seismometers be useful at all for feature location or tomography studies? as a way to improve station counts at lower costs, or are they not sensitive enough? Yeah. Uh, again, it's possible in principle, increasing the number of stations is a good thing. Um, they might work well in the middle of the night when man-made cultural noise is low. Typically, scientists will try to go to a quiet, out-of-the-way place and bury the, the sensor deep enough to get rid of meteorological noise. No, noise is the issue. You want to have a good signal to noise ratio. Um, the other thing, there's a lot of active volcanoes. The, the land where it would be best to put the instruments is owned by, you know, either the Park Service or the Forest Service or, or, or some government entity like that uh, rather than privately. And, um, you know, I'm all for the citizen science and, and putting more sensors out there. Um, is, they'd have to have accurate timing and have the signal characteristics known pretty well to be able to contribute to a, a more sophisticated scientific experiment. 
All right, a uh, question from Rodrigo Contreras. He asks, is there any difference in seismicity as it relates to magma composition? Um, aside from what I mentioned a little while back, that in, that basalt centers tend to have shorter swarms and the more silicic ones longer, um, it's not perfect answer or perfectly well known. And another bugaboo is some of the features of the seismicity may not be caused by the magma itself, but by the, the fluid front. Like when, when magma moves some depth to the surface, it starts losing gases. And those gases can form a fluid front that's out in advance of the magma. And that fluid front may be contributing to some of the seismicity we see. Second thing is when the, when the magma hits the water table, uh, regardless of its competition, there's an exchange of heat and mechanical energy uh, that can cause various types of seismicity. So the answer, the answer is, Sometimes yes and sometimes no, but it's not very clean. Uh, there are often several processes mixed together and we are in the unfortunate position to try to dissect which are the most important controlling parameters. All right, uh, we have a question from uh, Tammy Mulder and Tammy asks, uh, does one typically get a large event, say magnitude greater than three, to start off the puncture of the feeder tube into the overlying crust, or does it start with a high frequency swarm? Most cases I know start with relatively smaller events uh, and may build up to a, a larger one. Um, there may be a handful out there that would start with a single larger event, but most of the time, the most of the time, the the the, the activity, the, the underlying activity, which is the magma movement, is, is happening rather on a, on a slower time scale and it reaches some sort of a threshold. And that's when the, the you might get a transition into larger events. But usually, most of my cases I'm familiar with start on the relatively smaller side. All right. A uh, question from uh, Dinko Sindiha. And uh, he asks, what about very long period signals? Is there anything that can be inferred from those? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's modeling attempts trying to figure out um, if you have a good location, then you can figure out the uh, magma flux, a, a longstanding goal of volcano seismology is to be able to say how much magma is moving through a system. So some of the models for these very long period events involve uh, a flow into some sort of a conduit. And so that's so you, I don't think you'd be able to. Just analyzing the seismograms, I don't think you'd be able to say too much about composition. Um, as the, most of the types of answers that you get would be model dependent. And so if the model is right, you get a better answer. If the model is is uh, not as strong, then you, you get an answer that's a, that's a little less precise. All right, we're down to the last two questions. Uh, one is from Jennifer Hass, and uh, she asks, could you explain again the interaction with groundwater and what is possible to know in advance about the groundwater table that helps with understanding when that process starts? Uh, yeah, so, so we don't often know precisely where the groundwater is, but what happens is um, the combination of shallow depths and groundwater. First, groundwater moves around, so if the magma is moving slowly, then it's possible to exchange heat from the magma to the water, and then you set up sort of convection cells, so hot water would move away and the water would, would percolate around. So the observation that we see is that the, it's common that a lot of the low frequency events are happening at the same depths, shallow depths, one or two kilometers, where uh, open cracks exist and uh, groundwater flow is likely. It's not so much that we've been able to, say, drill well and sample all these things directly, because a lot of it is, is by inference. But it's basically an exchange. You're taking a hot magma and passing it through uh, a series of conduits and things that are generally in contact with the groundwater. So the groundwater can serve to uh, move heat around, uh, help uh, bleed off uh, stresses or, or, or occasionally some, some chemical constituents. But the, the, so that we, we tend to focus on what the magma is doing, but the, you can't ignore the fact that the water is there. And if the water is able to mix with the magma, then it can influence the explosivity of the eruptions. A series of experiments done some years ago uh, showed that if you have mostly water with a little bit of magma, like a pillow lava, then the pillow lava sort of spill out, but they get quenched right away. If you have a lot of magma and a little bit of water, then you, the magma activity mostly 
control sinks. But if the ratio by weight, I believe it was, of magma to water is about one to one, that makes it quite ex, uh, explosive combination. But th then you have the problem of how do you mix them together? So if you have a like a dike, you have a surface, the edge of the side of the dike that would be exposed to the groundwater, but the groundwater coming into contact with it would, would either fizz like a, like a drop of water on a hot frying pan or move away as in one of these convection cells that I was describing earlier. So that's that's the issue is, is how this actual mixture. So it comes down to the, the, the actual porosity and the geometry and the amount of, of water you have. I, I don't, I'm not a specialist in modeling these things. I've, I've seen some talks that, that tried to get at that, but that's, those are some of the, the parameters that are looked at. All right, and the last question uh, from Tammy Mulder, and this is uh, related, uh, is uh, would you, could you talk a little bit more about the relation of hot springs to volcanic magma chambers? Uh, okay, so yeah, so hot springs, again, the hot springs are one of the, or the hydrothermal features in general are, are some of the features that, that help transfer heat around. So uh, the ultimate source of heat may be the magma, but if magma is in contact with rock for long periods of time, then the rock itself can become hot enough to drive some of the geothermal activity. So it depends on uh, mechanically or, or, or spatially, where is the actual source of heat, magma or hot rock, and then where is the depth of the hydrothermal features that are using that heat and circulating it around. And there's, boy, I've seen a lot of imaginative diagrams over the years of of how these might look at all spatial scales. I think the you know geysers are the most common one that you see there. They offer a few hundred meters, uh, taking mostly hot rock that's just that's hot enough to heat the water um, from below. I don't see, haven't seen too many hydrothermal features that are direct transfer of heat from the magma right to the water at the hydrothermal features. I suppose it's possible in principle, but I think the the more common thing is that the 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 you know, first encounter with the molten rock, the water would cool the rock. So now you got solid rock up against the water, but if it's hot enough to boil the water, then you can drive all sorts of active hydrothermal features. Um, there's a, the geometry is, is the, one of the main controlling features for that type of activity. All right, well, we made it. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, for your presentation and also uh, answering the questions. And thank you all to the audience. That was a great, uh, great set of Q&A. Uh, this has been recorded. I'll put it up on YouTube uh, this afternoon and uh, we'll have uh, additional IRIS webinars in the future. So please stay tuned. But uh, Steve, thank you again for taking your time out to do this. And we'll see you all here sometime soon.